Well, hey folks, and welcome to Solar Cabin Channel. Uh, this video is going to be a bit different. Um, I recently got a puppy, and I've been training him. This is Tougher, and Tougher is Border Collie and Blue Heater. And you can see his markings. If he'll hold still, he's got uh, pretty much a, a, a Border Collie marking on his head. He's got the Blue, key, blue Heater uh, patchy color on his uh, body. Okay relax he's excited because we're going hiking and uh, this is part of my training uh, for my dogs which is really important because I do a lot of adventuring I uh, do a lot of adventure videos and uh, I go out in areas where there's a lot of uh, open country uh, where you, you generally I don't want my dogs on a leash I let them go and, and have their adventure and run around with me and we may uh, take a lot of trails and things like that so this is a uh, video is kind of going to be about how I train my off-grid dogs and might be important for people that do a lot of adventuring or outside uh, hiking and stuff like that with their dogs and want to have control of them without having to have them on a leash all the time. So that's what we've been working on with old Tuffer here and Taz. This is my other dog, Tazzy right here. She's a good girl. She's well trained in adventure hiking. And so we're going to go out uh, and do some, okay, okay. We're going to go out and do some adventure hiking uh, with uh, these two dogs. And uh, I'll kind of explain how I train them, but also give you a little bit of history of this area, uh, what I call the dunes, where I grew up as a kid, spent many, many days hiking and hunting rabbits and, and just adventuring in this area. So come on along. Okay, so here we are. And uh, these trails here are, are uh, what I call the dunes. It's just full of uh, sagebrush, cedar trees. And this whole area was like this before the homesteaders moved in and started uh, cultivating and, and doing agriculture and raising animals and things like that. This is pretty much how this area looked like uh, when my granddad moved back here as part of the original homesteaders. Now, my dogs right there, uh, they go on the trails with me. And one of the things that they need to do is to stay within uh, eyesight or smell of me uh, and also respond to commands. So... One of the things that you'll notice uh, with both of these dogs is that they will go a ways, but then they will always circle back and return. See how he's stopping there? He'll circle back now to make sure that I'm not too far away. That is actually training as part of uh, also their instinct, their pack instinct, is to never get too far away from the pack dog, the lead dog. And in this case, I am the lead dog. I am the, the pack leader, and they have to respect that. And they need to know that if I change directions, then they need to circle back to make sure where I'm at so they don't get lost. And I've had uh, experiences where dogs, sometimes when I was training them, didn't mind and would get off too far. And uh, then they get in danger. They're, they're likely to get lost. And if they can't find their way back, they may panic and run the wrong direction. So it's important that you do this kind of outdoor training. Uh, with your dog. Now you see, notice that uh, Tazzy there, my older dog, she circled back. She She's a lot more adventurous and she knows this area so she will go out and uh, get a farther, uh, quite a bit, quite a ways away. She might get, you know, half a mile away from me. But she'll always circle back to see where I'm at to see if I've changed direction because she's had that training. And uh, that's just to keep your pets safe while you're walking. And that way they can adventure, as you can see, they're off adventuring and smelling with stuff and chasing rabbits and things like that. What are you doing, resting under a tree already? We're just getting started. Now, he waited for me there. Now, he, if he does get, which happened uh, the other day, if he does get out where he can't see me and uh, gets away from me, he will generally stop and then I, I can whistle. And that's an important cue because a whistle travels a lot farther than a yell. And so I can whistle and we'll watch. See how he perked up? And Taz, see how she perked up? They both know that to listen to me. And if I call him back, come. Taz, come. See how she comes back? Well, she knows I'm just messing around. But how they'll, they'll circle back if I whistle. And we'll do this again a couple of times. Uh, that reinforces my command and control over them so they know that if I need to change directions or I want them to come back, they'll come back. Now this is also of course great exercise 
Uh, your dogs need exercise, especially a working dog, and a Blue Heeler and Border Collies are working dogs. Uh, they were raised and bred to uh, be used around animals. Uh, sheep primarily, but also cows. And uh, that, that's where the heeler, <laughs> the heeler name comes from, is because they will heal, uh, which means uh, get on the back heel side of a uh, cow or a sheep, and then move them around. They are a little bit more aggressive than a uh, some other cattle dogs. And so, generally, uh, you only want to get a heeler if you know that you're going to have a dog that can be sometimes aggressive. They also tend to be a uh, little less sociable. They like uh, one one owner, one person, uh, and uh, sometimes not so sociable with other dogs. But the Border Collie, and Taz there is a mix too. She is Blue Healer and another mix. I'm not exactly sure what the other dog is in her. We'll go up this way. See how she perked up? Turns. She notices that I'm going a different direction. Now. And he come right back when I whistle. Okay, so that's that's my training for uh, outdoor adventures so that they understand to always listen for my command and know where I'm at. Yes, use a good boy. Let's go. Always want to give them lots of confirmation that they're doing the right thing. Now a little bit of the history of this area. As I said, it was it all looked like this before the homesteaders moved in and uh, started doing agriculture and raising animals. But before that, this area here was primarily a hunting ground for Native Americans. And we had both Ute and Navajo uh, tribes that used this area as a hunting ground. And we know that because just over this hill right here, uh, you can still see where they uh, had their campgrounds, and we find a lot of arrowheads and uh, their grinding stones that they used to grind their grains in. And these cedar trees actually have a cedar berry on them, and uh, they would get the cedar berries and they would grind that in to a type of flour and would eat that. And we also find where, unfortunately, there was a, a skirmish in here at one time before my granddad moved here. When the first homesteaders moved in, uh, generally, the homesteaders got along fine with the Native Americans. In fact, they used to train, uh, trade uh, sugar and flour to the Native Americans for uh, uh, animals like rabbits and, and uh, also for horses and things like that because the Native Americans were very good at uh, catching wild horses and training them. And so they would trade back and forth between the homesteaders. But a skirmish happened in this area. Uh, and the story goes that uh, a young homesteader family moved into this area and uh, he was raising sheep. Now, it was generally understood that if the, the Native Americans got hungry in winter, they might steal a sheep or a cow uh, to feed their families. And who could, you know, who could uh, not, who could fault them for that? You know, they're trying to feed their families. But this young homesteader, apparently, he got upset because the Native Americans, and we don't know for sure which tribe it was uh, that was camping in this area, uh, got real hungry in winter and they uh, went and got one of his sheep. And uh, he got mad and he got a couple of his buddies and they came up and uh, in this area just over this hill here and they uh, decided to kill some of the Native Americans. And uh, they just attacked him at night apparently and shot some of them. Well of course that didn't go over very well at all with the tribe and so later they uh, found the homesteader's cabin, and that cabin is down over that way. It still exists, but it's on private property now. And they went down to their cabin, the Native Americans, and uh, they decided to take it out on the homesteader family, and they killed the homesteader family. Sad situation. And uh, nobody knew about it. The other homesteaders, the only time they really got together was for, like, church. And so when the young homesteader family didn't show up for church, they went looking for them to find out if anything was wrong. And they found them, they were hid in the cellar next to the old cabin. And so then they, of course, contacted the what they call the uh, native uh, agency, uh, the agents. And they come up and they push the Native Americans off of this land. And uh, it was kind of, they had already pretty much abandoned it because in Native American 
culture, uh, you don't bury uh, the Native Americans in this area. They would generally have to be returned to the family, and in most cases they would do what they have a ceremony for the dead, okay? And they believe that if you don't do that, then you are uh, leaving the spirit uh, so that it has to wander the earth. And that is where the uh, story of the uh, skinwalkers actually comes from, So, uh, which is also in this area. And so because of that, uh, the Native Americans pretty much abandoned this area, didn't want to have any more trouble with the homesteaders. The agents got involved. The homesteaders had to, to also be learned there uh, to respect the, the Native Americans that were here first and uh, get along with them. And it was quite a struggle because of that. So that's the history of this area in here. And uh, it is, oh, I consider it a beautiful country. Some people would think, oh, it's, it's just sand and rocks. Yeah. But it's great hiking, and there's a lot of good trails. And uh, we go out here and get our exercise just about every other day or so. We go out walking, and that way the dogs can get their exercise and also get trained for outdoor exploring. Uh, so that when I go to unfamiliar places, this is pretty familiar to Taz and Tuffy now. They've been out here several times, and Taz has been out here for years. So they're pretty experienced to this area, but if I take them into a new territory, uh, places they're not familiar with, they need to have those commands and controls, so if I whistle and call them back, they'll come right back and stay safe, and so we uh, can have a lot of fun and a good adventure, and they thoroughly enjoy this, what tougher, you thoroughly enjoy it, don't you? Now, some people have asked if we have uh, rattlesnakes in this area. There are rattlesnakes uh, here, but not in this uh, specific. I've never seen a rattlesnake in this area. Uh, but if you get up around reservoirs uh, where there's a water source, a lot of times you might find a rattler. But our rattlers here are small. Uh, they're not the big ones that you see like in Texas. and uh, But they do carry a, a pretty nasty bite from what I hear. Uh, but in this area, I don't have to worry about it uh, for the dogs or anything, which is why I like to hike them now. And if I'm in an unfamiliar area, if I'm not sure, then I'm really careful with my dogs because rattlesnakes and foxes and coyotes would take a little dog like that in a heartbeat. And so that's another reason they have to, to stay close to me because they're not likely to be attacked by another animal if they're next to me. So that's for their safety as well. Now, there is wildlife all over in this area, though we'll not likely see it because I'm talking. Uh, but we get deer, elk, a lot of uh, rabbits. And we used to get snowshoe hares, uh, which if any of you are familiar with, they're a great big old wild rabbit. I mean, huge. Uh, and we used to see those a lot when I was a kid uh, in this area. But uh, there's been a drought in this area. And you found a stick? There's been a drought in this area for a long time and the result is uh, the temperatures have changed and gotten a lot warmer and so I think if there was snowshoe hares they probably are not in this area anymore and have moved up where the snow stays up higher you can see the mountains back there that is part of the uh, Rocky Mountain foot of the Rocky Mountains and we still have so we'll have snow up there probably all year up on the higher parts uh, we're at about 4800 elevation here and it goes clear up to about 9000 up there at the higher points and we will get snow a lot of snow up there and the snowshoe hares have a really thick heavy coat so i don't think they like this warmer climate that we now have down here and so they have probably moved up higher in fact i seen one uh, a few months ago uh back up higher towards the mountains they don't come down here as much but we used and same thing we used to have a lot of jackrabbits and a lot of cottontails now we still get a few occasionally but nothing like it was when i was a kid we used to have pheasants and rabbits everywhere which is great as a kid because i used to do a lot of hunting as part of keeping the family fed uh, but they're not near as populous as they used to be in this area now tazzy there she's getting kind of old she's about nine now and uh she never had puppies she never caught even though she she i thought she could and so that's another reason that I got old tougher there is to kind of give her a companion 
Uh, she's fine by herself, though. She doesn't really need a companion. It was as much for me as it was for her. But uh, I think it's good for them to have a companion. Uh, and also, she helps train him. Because he's. if you notice, he, he'll follow her. And she's helping to train him. And that's good if you have a an experienced outdoor adventure dog like old Tazaru there. Uh, working with your younger pups because she will help train him to help him keep safe. And sometimes she keeps him in line with a good nip. But uh, in general, they get along pretty well. And she loves to, when she was younger, she loved to chase rabbits. Uh, she never caught one, but she, she chased them a lot. And now she's more uh, likely to chase a lizard and corner it in a bush or a rock or something and try and get a lizard. And once in a while, she'll get a tail. And if you know about lizards, they, they will, uh, their tails are made to uh, be tore off if they get into some kind of trouble. Uh, get a predator after him, but it doesn't hurt the lizard. The lizard will regrow another tail. So a few times she's come back with Timmy with a lizard tail in her mouth. Huh. Only tough. And I used to wander through this area as a kid. We moved here when I was eight. Moved back to my granddad's old homestead. And that is where, if you've watched my other videos, my cabin is on... Uh, part of my granddad's old homestead, my dad's inherited it from him along with his brothers and sisters. They split parts up, and uh, I inherited a small piece, about an acre, where I built my off-grid cabin. And uh, I raised my off-grid dogs. And uh, I like to come out adventuring as much as possible, get out here and hike. and Because I grew up in this beautiful territory, and uh, love to get out and get some exercise. And go walking and exploring and uh, we go out and look for I do some rock hunting and I do a little bit of uh, uh, metal detecting and I've done some panning for gold and there was gold in there is gold in this area if you know where to look but I was never very good at it never found anything substantial uh, now this area is pretty much a lot of oil well drilling in this area uh, and it, it was kind of taken over and it's sad because you know I'd rather not see the oil wells where there used to be uh, good animal territory, but it provided jobs, a lot of jobs for the locals in the area. Uh, so, you know, it, it reduced the poverty because this area was, uh, because it, it is part, it's right next to the, the Native American reservations, uh, BLM land, and was uh, original homesteader land. Uh, because it's just not all that great, as you can see, it's not all that great of land uh, to be growing stuff and uh, would take a lot of work to build a homestead so the homesteaders moved in and they they kind of changed that uh, and so now there's some pretty big farms cattle farms I don't think anybody raises sheep a lot here anymore but there's a lot of cattle farms in this area uh, a lot of hay being grown some horses uh, but for the most part uh, oil well oil drilling is still the primary uh, income source for most of the people that live in this area and uh, whoop tez has got something what was it she found an old dead ah, leave it and that was another command you notice i told her to drop that she's been trained not to eat things until she just checks it with me because out in this area you might find some old dead animal that had was had a disease that some farmer drug up in here and I don't want her to uh, get sick. So she brought that old, it looked like an old rabbit foot, probably wouldn't hurt her at all. But she brought it over to me to show, and I told her, Uck, she understands that and means sickening bad. And she dropped it and just left it. She didn't argue about it. <clears throat> all right, we're getting back to the truck now. And that wasn't a really long walk. Probably about a quarter mile, maybe. Uck, uck. That was it. Uck. Uck, Tazaru, tougher. Uck, come, come there. So he got a little of that training too now. Come on. He found he found an old jackrabbit leg too, and so now he had to be trained. And you notice he looked at me when I whistled and called him. He dropped it and come. So that's good training. Uh, keep them safe, so they don't pick up something that might make them sick. And that's, you know, an adventure dog, they have to be prepared. They could come across any kind of dead animal or live animal. And, uh, you know, we get all these other, some of the other animals we get in this area. We do have skunks. We have raccoons. 
Uh, occasionally we will get a cougar, but rarely down in this low area. The cougars are mostly up in the mountains. We have quite a few cougars uh, up in the mountains, up in that air area. We do have uh, brown bear, uh, however, never down this low. About the only place you'd see a brown bear is up there in the mountains. Uh, you, and they have warnings up at the campgrounds up there because there have been uh, bears spotted. But generally, there hasn't been an attack by a bear here forever. Uh, and mostly just stupid people leaving their trash out, not protecting their food that attracts the bears to their camps. That causes problems. Bears are not a big, uh, big uh, issue in this area, and there's not very many of them. And the cougars have been depleted because of hunters uh, going after the cougars. And we rarely see one down here. Uh, we used to have a lot of pheasants and uh, uh, quail, wild quail, and they uh, tried to reestablish the quail prod, uh, population here. Recently, they transplanted a bunch of quail back into this area, and they also transplanted uh, the uh, bald headed buzzards which are black buzzards, and also bald eagles into this area. And they you'll see them. I haven't seen them in a while, but you will see them. They have a pretty white territory. And they're trying to get them reestablished here in this area so that they can have a safe place to, and lots of game for them to hunt. And so occasionally when we're out walking, we'll see eagles or buzzards. There's the truck. All right. That was my adventure for the day, Hiked, hiking with the dogs and uh, doing some training. And that was all uh, very good training for adventure dogs uh, to, so they can go out in these open places. I don't have to have them on a leash the whole time. Uh, they can run and romp and have fun. And then old Tuffaroo there, who has lived up to his name, he thinks he's pretty tough. Now, when I first started coming out here walking, and I've only had him for about five days, when I first started coming out here walking with him, he pretty much hung right on my feet. Uh, he didn't get away from me like he's, you can see him doing right there now. He's become a lot more confident. And part of that confidence is he knows that I'm here. He knows if he gets in trouble, he can come back to me. And if I call him, he will come back so he knows that he's going to stay with me. That's all part of the training, too. They can, they can feel free to do some adventuring and smelling and having fun. But they also know that the pack leader, that is me, is right here and is watching out for them and will take care of them. And old Tazzy Roo, she's a good dog at that, huh? You is. You's a very good girl. Yes, you is. All right, shall we go get some lunch? I think that was a pretty good walk. Let's go get some lunch. And we got cold pizza waiting for us at home. <laughs> All right, folks. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this uh, little video. It's a little bit different, but uh, I know that uh, a lot of you out there may be getting puppies or training your dogs for to be adventure dogs. So I thought this video might help uh, to kind of give you some basics of uh, the kind of training that I do for my adventure dogs to keep them safe and so that uh, we can... Uh, work safely and, and have a lot of fun out in the outdoors without my having to constantly yell at them and, and constantly badger them. They can have fun, but they understand that they have to follow my commands and I'm the lead pack dog in this situation. All right, folks, uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about off-gridding, go to my website, simplesolarhomesteading.com. I have uh, an ultimate off-grid ebook on there. It's only $5. 351 pages teach you everything about uh, off-grid living, uh, raising animals, building your own homesteads, installing water and solar, and I have lots of cabin plans on there. For $5 a piece, you can get yourself a really nice cabin plan that is designed by an off-gridder for off-grid use. All right, folks, have a great day.